Good morning. Thanks for clicking on the video. This is a history of the first breeding for me of Peter's Twin Spots. I can't say this is how you should try to breed them, but this is what worked for their first clutch. In talking with some more experienced breeders, a lot of what I ran into sounds pretty similar, so there may be some general tips and techniques or ideas for working with this species. So if that's interesting, stay tuned. So I was lucky enough to get this pair of twin spots. They are just out of quarantine, so they're looking pretty rough. Um, the female's bald, the male's missing fe feathers. She's missing some feathers on her back as well. But they're healthy and active, eating well. Everything looks good, and they're in a flight cage currently uh, five feet wide, two feet deep, and four feet high. Due to the timing of um, their quarantine, they are in the middle of breeding season. I'm always in a quandary whether I should allow them to try them to breed or not, but um, they seemed very relaxed and comfortable. They settled in really well, so I decided to let them try. I wasn't able to capture the full courtship, but I got some of it, so I'll let that play out what I did get. They have um, water and bath water available at all times. They have a good seed mix. They have REFF commercial egg food mix, um, mineral grit, and millet spray available all the time. And then in the dishes are an egg food and sprouted seed mix that I make. The only live food that these guys were given were mealworms, um, tiny mealworms at first, up to medium-sized mealworms as the chicks were growing replenished every two hours. This is the corner um, that I set up for some privacy with moderate density just vegetation. Mind you, it's right by the door going into the bird room and right next to the main hallway that I go by a thousand times. Because this is a ground nesting species, my idea was I would use this modified bath. It's just got modified in the sense that I've drilled holes in it for ventilation and um, pre-configure it with some burlap and I hung it inside the cage under all of that greenery in the hopes that they would nest inside of it and not on the grass itself. That would enable me to pull the, or slide the grass out and clean it. That was an epic fail. It did not work. I ended up having to cut the grass and just leave a chunk of it under the nest. Um, I hung it initially about two inches above the grass um, but after watching the birds try like crazy to get underneath it, I raised it up to about four inches above the grass level, and apparently that was perfect for building underneath. The uh, normal nesting material that I provide is burlap cut into about six inch long strings, and they use that to construct the majority of the nest. Um, it seemed to me that the male did all of the building, um, including collecting materials for the <clears throat> lining and then the female did the arranging inside. Um, the construct of the nest, nest is, um, you know, a typical nest chamber. It has the entry to the left. There's an escape hatch to the right. And as an aside, all of my finches always have this kind of idea, either a narrow part of the wall of the dome or a hidden exit. And I wonder about using 
nest boxes if that's a problem for some of the species because of that. Just a thought. Uh, one thing I found interesting is that they were pretty cagey about They didn't want me to see them going in and out of the nest or, they, or feeding the chicks, that sort of thing. But given that, they made a pretty big debris runway leading right to the nest entrance. My impression was that was deliberate, not just stuff that was, you know, strewn around like you get when they're, when the birds are building up in the, um, higher in the vegetation. But anyway, when they were about done with the macro construction, I added um, a couple other things they might want for lining the nest. Um, paper, uh, moss, and neither of those were particularly interesting to them. Um, I should also mention I always put the nesting material in the farthest corner away from where they're going to build. I somehow have gotten the impression over the years that that's important, that they need to go hunt for it and then bring it back to the nest. I don't know why, maybe that's not, but that's what I always do, just in case that's of interest. Um, but in any case, uh, although these were not interesting to them, little white feathers were just what they were looking for. So here's kind of a lengthy clip of the male, but I think it's pretty funny. For feathers, I just use um, goose feathers and then I cut them up into manageable sizes, I guess. And these are more the downy parts of the feathers. But uh, anyway, this is the end result. A lot of them ended up part of the decoration, but the inside nest chamber is lined with feathers as well. This is a picture of the final configuration of the nest. Although the grass is curled up, so the nest looks shallower than it really is, it's about four inches or so um, top to bottom. At 10 days of incubation, I started adding live tiny mealworms to the egg food sprouted seed and the regular diet that I already explained. Chicks hatched right at 12 days. All five eggs were fertile. The first two chicks, the first chick died shortly after hatching, I believe of natural causes. The second egg um, pipped but did not break the shell. And then the final three chicks that hatched the next day were fine and those are the ones that have now grown up to independence. The squeaking that you hear in the background is black-cheeked waxbill chick. Sorry about that. Um, quite a novelty to have the chicks walk out of the nest for me. These three chicks fledged right on schedule on day 21, and they went back into the nest at night for the next three days, three or four days, I believe. Uh, I have heard that sometimes they fledge early, but not in this case. I removed the nest and cleaned. <laughs> Uh, when I was sure they weren't going back into it at night. I would say the parents are solid. They're a little secretive, but they were solid incubating. They tolerated nest checks. They were pretty chill about the chicks fledging. Um, they only, they happily ate egg food, chitted seed, other seed mixes, and the mini mealworms. They ate a lot of them, um, but I would say they were good parents. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different about this species is that they go into a molt really, really quickly. So even before they're independent, I can already see some of the spots of the twin spot on the belly and the belly getting darker. Um, and that's, you know, 
10 days after they fledge, they're already molting into it. So that's pretty quick. The chicks come out of the egg reasonably competent with perching, I would say. You know, the usual hanging on the sides of the cage and that sort of thing. Um, the parents do feed on the perch when the chicks are pretty new, but later on they much prefer to feed on the ground, and maybe they did so every time I wasn't there, and I only saw them feeding on the perch because I happened to be there. Um, you'll notice in this video, as is typical, the dad preferentially feeds um, a couple of the chicks and the mom preferentially feeds the other chick. So that's worth noting or paying attention to because um, I ended up having to separate the parents for a while. So I'll talk about that in a sec. The only real problem that I had with this um, breeding is that the male wanted to start a second clutch maybe when the chicks were six days out of the nest and the female wasn't ready and the chasing got to be pretty fierce. And I could see over the course of the day that the chick that she was feeding was getting weaker. So I decided to separate the male from the female and the chicks. The female did feed the chicks, but she was preferentially feeding one chick over the other two. And at some point, after about a day, she decided she did not want to she didn't want one of the other chicks around. Perhaps it's a female, perhaps it's the, one of the chicks that the dad was feeding. Um, I don't know. But she was chasing that chick pretty aggressively. So I ended up putting the male and the female and the two, three chicks back together again, and that resolved. And at that point, the male took over maybe 90% of the feeding of all the chicks. And uh, I think maybe I just got lucky there but there's seems likely to me that there may be some management involved with um, parent raising this species. Another thing that was kind of interesting to watch was how the chicks arrange themselves around the parent when they're begging. They kind of shoot forward and then scooch backwards and go forward and backwards. I haven't seen that before. Let's see if there's a little bit of it in this video here. super curious about the, um, you can sort of see that the gape has a different color, very yellow versus kind of a whiter gape. And I'm kind of wondering if that's related to who's feeding who or possibly sexes. So I don't know enough about any of that to be able to make any kind of, maybe it's just an age, you know, the chicks that are slightly older, the gape color changes or something. I don't know. But I'm not uh, experienced enough to speculate on the sex of the chicks just yet. So this is all I can share at the moment and hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.